Thank you very much. Uh, the panel take their seats on the stage, please. So, good morning once again. You've heard from me already, so I won't go through uh, exactly what I said before. This is a, a panel about uh, climate positivity and the global impact. And we've heard a lot this morning about why a net positive approach is preferable, why, why, why it can be advantageous, uh, some of the more theoretical approaches to it. And on this panel, I want to get to some of the more practical details of what does a net positive approach look like in practice? What are some of the challenges in implementing it? What are some of the opportunities? Um, and hear from four companies who are already making waves in this space, make, making progress and implementing. Uh, I'm going to start the panel by asking each of them, I'll introduce them first, and then asking each of them to speak for two or three minutes, mainly outlining what they're doing. And then I'll uh, open it up for discussion. I've got a set of questions to ask them around the, the practical application aspects of their approaches. And then if there's time, I'll open, the, uh, open it up to the floor for questions. So uh, four speakers I have this morning are Ian Cheshire, who is the Group Chief Executive of Kingfisher, uh, has been since January 2008. Uh, previously, as many of you know, CEO of B&Q. He's been at uh, Kingfisher for 15 years and uh, has worked in the retail sector for a long time. He's also the chairman of the British Retail Consortium. Uh, at the second from my right is uh, Peter White, who is visiting professor at Newcastle University. Many of you will know him as previously, and until just a few weeks ago, uh, the director of sustainability at Procter & Gamble, where he basically set up Procter & Gamble's sustainability program, and particularly their sustainability leadership council. Uh, the third speaker will be uh, Paul Crew, who is the Head of Sustainability Engineering and Energy, that's quite a bit of portfolio, at Sainsbury's and has been the architect and driver between some of Sainsbury's uh, incredible achievements around sustainability. And last but by no means uh, least, I have uh, Magnus, uh, sorry, one moment, Magnus Rosen, who is uh, the Head of Sustainability at SKF and he leads their Beyond Zero portfolio. And he's seen that Beyond Zero strategy from the strategic thinking at the beginning right through to implementation now and is focusing on very much the operational aspects, how to implement, how to measure and how to assess it, its success. So as I say, I'm going to give each of them two or three minutes to start. And Ian, after, after you please. Um, uh, good morning everyone and it's um, great to see a, uh, a big gathering, particularly around Net Positive, which is a theme that... that um, we thought we launched a year ago, and then it turns out everyone else had the same idea, which is great, um, because actually we do need people to come on this journey. And I, I just really want to make four very, very quick points, which I'm sure we'll come back to. Um, firstly, our experience with Net Positive is that we had to decide where to play, and I think this is true for every company. You know, the difference between Sainsbury's, SKF, and us is that we can have different impacts. And I think it's perfectly okay to pick your, your points of difference. So we've gone timber, energy, community, and innovation, because that's, what, as retailers, I think what we can do. The Sainsbury's retail challenge will be subtly different, but there'll be overlap. So picking your areas to be net positive, as opposed to some generic sort of feel-good, fuzzy, I'm going to do something vaguely good, um, I think is, is important. Secondly, I think you have to make sure the business internally understands the business case. And if you're not spending all your time communicating the business case, to the point when you're really sick of talking about it for the 25th time, you're probably not doing uh, your job because if it is just at the right thing to do, which is great, um, it'll probably not survive the change of CEO or, or, or the first economics or down, uh, headwinds. So making sure people understand, look, you're picking this because we have an impact and we can benefit and it creates a more sustainable business is a really important continuous education challenge. But without that, it's not part of the DNA. Um, third bit is, is I think you have to recognize that once you've done the thought leadership, and we think we've done our framework, you, the most difficult phase I think we're right in the middle of, which is doing exemplar projects, putting our first feet on the ground, and trying to work out how we could then scale them up. And that's the point when you're going to get sort of hit from both sides, which is, you know, the extreme greens will probably say, well, you're not doing enough. And, and the business people are saying, you know, you're smoking some sort of dangerous substance. You know, what, what are you doing at all? And actually, you've got to just have the courage to keep going through that. Uh, and, and perseverance plays a huge part in this. So it is a journey of going to scale. And the final bit is, because it's a journey that we don't know uh, all the answers by any stretch of the imagination, you know, being net positive by 2050 is, is um, going to be a big set of challenges. 
um, we're very clear that it has to be based around uh, a genuine collaboration. And there's two types of collaboration uh, that would be useful. One is um, getting some of the multiple agendas in the NGO government world a little bit more aligned, so there was a bit more sort of unity on that front. And where I think we have cooperated effectively, it has worked. And the second is trying to get a series of particularly businesses to work together because um, you know, I, I, on my own, for example, around timber, I'm very happy to jump up and down, but actually we needed IKEA, we needed M&S, and we needed Carrefour to get the ban on, on the European ban on illegal timber. And there's going to be multiple examples of either academic collaboration, NGO, government, but it's about trying to put together an effective coalition which is focused on pragmatic progress. And I think the more we can get our heads around the idea that actually it's better to do this, it's better if all my competitors have got FSC certified wood, ultimately, because it'll push the supply chain, it'll make it, make it better for all of us longer term. And we will always find leadership opportunities um, because we, we'll just hopefully got there first. But we would like to take the whole of the rest of the industry with us. And I think that's a very different mindset from some of the traditional business thinking. So uh, it's a fantastic journey. I encourage everyone to set off on their own net positive journey. And uh, don't mind that you don't know exact route yet. Um, but because what you will find, I absolutely guarantee, is a whole set of opportunities and a whole set of partners who are willing to collaborate with you. And so far, one year in, uh, I think we're, we're very happy with the uh, early progress we've made. Thank you, Ian. Peter, so we've heard uh, designing where to play, exemplar projects, genuine coalition, and making the business case. Tell me a bit about your experience with this. I came with three points, um, and I heard them in the first speech, the second speech, and the <laughs> third speech. But my marketing friends tell me that people can only run, you can only remember three things, and you have to tell people things six times before they'll actually remember it. So if my, I'm the sixth time you've heard some of these points, so I hope it will stick. Um, P&G, uh, been around 175 years. Um, the purpose of P&G is to improve the lives of the world's consumers now and for generations to come. And currently, uh, P&G is the world's biggest consumer goods company. Um, we set a goal <coughs> a couple of years ago. By 2015, we would reach an additional billion consumers. To give you some feel of the scale, that would make us 5 billion consumers by 2015. We currently reach 4.6 billion consumers around the world. Now, if you're reaching consumers at that scale, the only way, if you think about it, to do it is sustainably. Um, because otherwise, where are your materials going to come from? Where's the energy going to come from? How are you going to actually, will your consumers have the water to use the products? There's a whole raft of things there that unless you take a long-term view and unless you view it from a sustainability point of view, you wouldn't have a business. And that's, how we, that's our business case, is this could either be a, a, a block to the long-term growth of the business or it's an opportunity for the long-term growth. And it's a pretty easy, if you pose that question to a CEO or to, to a board, it's a pretty easy answer what they want to go with. Um, interesting, I heard the phrase zero washing and the, earlier today, and I thought perhaps that was, I mean, that's what a company like P&G or even a Unilever would, would say, well, you know, zero, if people aren't washing, that's no business. But in the future, if there's no water, there's no laundry, there's no business. And so the whole thing around carbon and water is really about long-term uh, business. That's why we set out, 2010, we set out the long-term vision of the company. If we're going to improve the lives of that many consumers, we want to do it without the environmental impact attached. Now, how do you do that? You need, we, we said we want you know, all the materials in our products and uh, packaging to be renewably sourced um, from sustainable sources in plants that run on 100% uh, renewable energy, so that would get rid of the fossil emissions, where the water that comes out of the plant is as clean as, if not cleaner than the water that goes in. No manufacturing waste going to landfill. But most importantly, we make products that will allow our consumers to reduce their impact. And that's the big opportunity we have. Because we heard from Jim, you know, three points really are, firstly, of course, Jim said, it's price of entry, you've got to reduce your own um, emissions. Um, so, you know, uh, renewable energy in our plants, uh, solar panels on the roof, you, you take things off trucks and put them on um, trains and boats. Um, the whole you know, internal piece, of course, you have to do that. Um, even if your business is growing as ours uh, has been, I mean, if you look back 2002, 2012, 10 years, the business doubled, the profit tripled, but CO2 em emissions from our um, operations went down 15%. So you can actually decouple. Second point, I think we've also heard, if, if you're going to go um, 
uh, net positive, or if you're going to go to zero, you've got to understand where your impacts are. Now, a colleague from HP said earlier about you know, measuring the impacts across their business. T about 10 years ago, we did this and looked at the whole energy footprint of all of P&G's products through all its life cycle stages. Uh, and it shaped the, 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 the last 10 years of R&D and consumer communications. We found that the thing that drives it is that people wash their clothes in hot water. You've heard it already from uh, Jim mentioned this. But if you understand, that drives the CO2 impact of the whole corporation, not just the laundry business, the whole corporation. So if we're not making products that wash in low temperature and telling consumers about the benefits and marketing and driving campaigns like Turn to 30, then we're really missing a trick because that's where we have the opportunity to go positive is to reduce the impacts elsewhere in the, in the life cycle. So consumers is the big one. The other one you've also heard is supply chain. Um, the whole area of get the, our move to more renewable materials, materials like BioPE, actually reduces CO2 emissions over the life cycle in our products by 170%. Well, how can you reduce it by 170%? You, you take away the emissions and you turn it into a carbon sink because you are actually um, sequestering carbon in the life cycle. So that's the way you can actually start going into the positive um, with materials like that. And in many cases, you can't do that by yourself because you need the industry to change. And that comes to the third point, which you've also heard, is about collaboration. Um, collaboration on the innovation, things like um, the BioPET Collaborative, where we're working with folks like Ford and Nike, to develop the, the chemistry and the, the technology to actually make new materials from biofeedstocks. But then the other example I was going to quote, and you've heard it many times already, the Consumer Goods Forum again, a uh, great initiative whereby all, all the, uh, the major manufacturers, the major um, retailers, all coming together to do something that none of us could do by ourselves. So, you know, P&G has made a commitment that by 2015 we'll only source um, sust certified sustainable palm oil, commitments on pulp sourcing, packaging sourcing, and so on. But again, I think the, the key point there is the collaboration helps us to do much more than we were going to do before, both collaboration within the industry, but increasingly collaboration with governments and NGOs as well. Great, thank you, Peter. So some, some recurring themes there, some clear targets, collaboration, think about the consumers. Paul. OK, thank you for that, um, and good morning. Um, just to, to say thank you very much, you've trumped me. Um, Sainsbury's is a mere 143 years old. Um, and um, we'll just give you a bit of scale. We've got 1,000 stores purely within the United Kingdom. Um, and it was set up by Mr. and Mrs. Sainsbury's in Drury Lane um, just over 143 years ago. Um, every week, we have 23 million customers visit us. Um, and more importantly, we have 150,000 colleagues that work for us and 4,000 farmers and 10,000 supply partners that work solely for us on our own brand products. So when we talk about carbon, we just go far beyond the operating carbon that we generally perceive to operate under. It's right in the supply chain. Um, Sainsbury's has a, a strong tradition of being trusted by our customers to do the right thing. And as part of my role coming into to Sainsbury's to think about how we can move sustainability forward, I managed to go through the archives and find in 1913, um, Sainsbury's was ar ar archiving and um, recycling cardboard, which is you know, quite a mean feat back in 1913. Um, but bring us up to the present day, where are we now? Well, Sainsbury's really needed a tool and a mechanism to get us onto our journey of reducing carbon right here and now. The past is a great thing to learn from, but we needed to move forward as quickly as possible. So in November 2011, um, the minds of the organisation and, and supply partners and academia and some of our consultants got together to say, actually, how are we going to make this real? And how are we going to make this tangible? And how are we going to move forward at a pace that we know we needed to, to move forward on? So we came up with our 20 by 20 sustainability plan. So it's 20 key objectives to land by 2020 across our core five values of doing business. The key one I want to focus on today is respect for the environment. And under respect for the environment, this is absolutely working out how low we can go 
in driving carbon emissions out of our operations. And in sitting below that, we had two clear objectives. The first one being we will reduce absolutely our carbon emissions by 35% by 2020. And that's from a base year of 2005. And then by bearing in mind by 2020, we'll have grown our entire estate by a further 50% in scale. But the most important and most challenging target that we have is that we said absolutely we'll support our supply partners, so those 10,000 suppliers and those 4,000 farmers, to, to reduce their carbon emissions by 50% by 2020. But for me, having a sustainability plan isn't about having a really nice, sexy, glossy document. It really is about having a living plan that is supported at every level of your business. And I'm fortunate within Sainsbury's to have that absolute support from the chairman, the CEO, right through the business, but most importantly, my CFO. So my CFO absolutely, 100% owns the checkbook. Um, he is my arch nemesis in Sainsbury's <laughs> and keeps me on the straight and narrow. But the important thing is, by working with the board and with my CFO, by giving show and tells and talking about all the great things that the speakers previously have shared with you, to really understand that climate change is an important factor for every business. It's important because he understands and he realises that for the sustainable success of Sainsbury's going forward, there absolutely needs to have commercial sense. And the business cases that I bring forward absolutely land commercial sense. And that then allows me to have the commercial opportunity to do the right thing, but also do the things that we're trusted to do as a, as a, as a successful retailer to do the right things for our colleagues and customers. And for me, our plan isn't really called net zero or carbon positive or carbon negative. We've got our own plan. We know where we want to get to. And if we class that as our version of getting to the stars and my 20 by 20 plan allows me to jump onto the moon, then I'm happy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. So again, underline the importance of a commercial motivation for this and a business case. So uh, finally, Magnus, perhaps you can enlighten us on that as well. Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about these uh, very challenging and interesting questions. I'll use my first minutes to broadly introduce also the SKF Group. Uh, this is a multinational industrial company. We, we are business <coughs> to business, headquartered in Sweden, only 106 years old. We have now grown into a 7.5 billion euro worth of sales company and we have more than 44 thousand employees. We provide uh, technologies on five platforms. We have bearings, seals, mechatronics, lubrication systems and services that are used in several customer applications in almost any type of industry such as cars, trucks, railway, uh, wind energy, aerospace, food and beverage to, to mention a few. We strive for incorporating sustainability in everything we do. We have at the top headline uh, the word integration. One very central uh, uh, strategy within our sustainability work is what we call SKF Beyond Zero. This is a strategy that was launched in 2005 and it consists of two parallel ambitions. First, we shall reduce the negative impacts from our operations towards zero. And second, we shall help others to reduce their impact. So, for example, we reduce the energy use and CO2 emissions from the SKF factories and we help the customers to do the same. When this strategy was launched, in 2005, there was a lot of focus on getting order in the own house, so making sure that we did all we could to improve our environmental performance. Since then, we have talked more and more about how to crystallize 
the positive uh, side of uh, the Beyond Zero strategy. And uh, we got the task to try and define what that actually is, try and measure the impact of that positive side, both in financial terms, but also in environmental terms. And that is the focus of we now, what we now call the, the SKF Beyond Zero portfolio, which consists of those solutions that provide significant environmental benefits to customers. A benefit here is measured as the, the performance of the SKF solution compared to a baseline solution. And we, we <coughs> have as a criteria to have no environmental trade-offs over the life cycle. So in all of this, I think integration is, uh, is a key word. I agree to the points that most of you also brought up here. We, know, we, we have to know uh, uh, how we define these things, of course. Uh, we need to understand the business case. In SKF, we use the term, it has to make sense. It has to make sense to stakeholders, externally as well as internally. And uh, I think that is something that we can uh, continue to discuss. Great. Thank you very much, Magnus, and to all of you for your opening remarks. So let's take up this theme. It, ha it has to make sense. Well, from an environmental perspective, it clearly does make sense, which is kind of part of the reason we're here. But, you know, with over 500 years of existence between your companies, you've clearly been doing something right. Why change it? You know, you're, you, you're all selling goods, your share prices are improving, and so on and so forth. Why look for something that is, at least on the surface, difficult, that your investors may not understand? You may have to convince people inside your company, you think, well, look, we're doing this perfectly well. Why change? So, Ian, why now? Okay. Why bother? Uh, by contrast, I should point out, I'm, I'm this sort of unruly adolescent here, only four, <laughs> 40 years old, so um, uh, I've got a long way to go. Um, I, I think we, we saw quite clearly, there are, there are, for businesses, there, there's a real sense of risk and opportunity. And, um, if you don't think about your business model in a 10 to 20 year view of the world, as well as a you know, next quarter, you will be caught out at some point, um, either because that business model is based on some unspoken assumptions you haven't really sort of excavated, uh, and you're exposed to things like material prices changing or competitive shifts happening, or there will be new sets of opportunities emerging that you just haven't got yourself to. And I think most businesses struggle with stepping outside existing paradigms and you know, how do I make money? And the answer is normally by doing slightly better at everything I've done for the last 20 years. And what this is an attempt to do is to challenge the thinking that says, look, you've still got the day job, you've still got people worrying about you know, squeezing out the percent here and the percent there. But actually, we, we as a leadership group need to be thinking about how can we build a truly sustainable business that will be around at least for another 40 years and ideally uh, as long as some of the guys next to me. And the risks and opportunities, when you start to look at them, become very real. And for us, and I'm sure for some of the other companies here, one of the ways into this has been uh, the impact of commodity and energy prices on changing your business model. And if you're, even with um, uh, Jerry's fantastic cars, you know, I run an out-of-town retailer. If people can't afford to drive their cars as often, uh, and they're going to find it more convenient to uh, have a, you know, a delivery van come to their store, that changes my business model quite significantly, and that is about the fact that energy prices shift. If I have, you know, as I do in the UK, B&Q sells 100% sustainable product on, on tim all forms of timber, down to the last stick of sandpaper, um, I am very interested to know how much of that is around, because if, if other people start getting into this, or, or if there's pressure on that, then my price pressure directly to my consumer will start to reflect, the, the, if you like, the external pressures. Um, so I've got, if you like, two sets of, of risks there. I've also got opportunities, and, and we're interested in energy efficiency. We, we believe as retailers, you know, we can face into our consumers, we face into our supply chains. Our biggest impact is probably helping our millions of consumers live differently. And for me, the interesting thing is, you know, energy efficiency is the current opportunity, massive opportunity to help consumers, you know, with 30% of the energy use coming in the house. Actually, the really interesting opportunity when you ever want to have fun in a focus group is tell a bunch of customers they won't have to pay an energy company a bill again, and they, they get very, very motivated. So how, how do we help our customers maybe become net positive producers of energy? 
through maybe a street-based scheme or a local scheme in addition to the energy efficiency measures in the house. And we, we're looking also at, at shifting models. I know Sally briefly touched on Street Club. But if you think very differently, you, you might just discover with a circular economy hat on a very different model of how business might create value. And I think if you're not doing that, you'll, you'll always be a follow-up. And that's the tough part about business is, you know, explain to people in, in a world of quarterly earnings um, that you're doing this stuff which is 10, 15 years out. Uh, to which my response is, well, you know, we, we seem to be quite happy to sign leases for shops that are 20 years. You know, we put down freehold projects. Guys build vast plants that have to have 20, 30-year plans. Uh, why don't we have a 20, 30-year business model plan? And I think there'll be opportunity in there as well as, well as the risk. But I think unless you tie it to the core purpose of your business, and ours is allowing people to have better homes for, for better lives, there's no sense of, well, why does, it, why does it make sense? So I think you've got to tie it to the business case and then talk about a 20, 30-year risk and opportunity set. And frankly, the opportunities in 20 years' time, probably I don't know what they are now, but hopefully the next generation of management will be, will be all over it and will be a leader in 20, 40 years' time. Let me just pick up on the shareholder piece. The mm -hmm. uh, founder of a very well-known new technology company said last week that it would be uh, derogation of his fiduciary responsibility to pay taxes beyond what <laughs> the law absolutely requires, whatever the spirit might be. You know, your shareholders might say, yeah, look, this is all well and good. But what we're really interested is in next quarter, quarter sales. Yeah. So how do you match those two together? Well, I think actually, if, um, and I don't know how this works out in other countries, but if you look at the Companies Act at the moment, you've actually got as directors written in an obligation to think of the company and multiple stakeholders anyway. So simply thinking about next quarter's finances, you're actually, I would argue, being irresponsible because if you're doing it in a way that means it's not going to be around in 10 years, then frac yeah, those owners should value your company rather more lowly than the company that can say I'll be around in 30, 40 years. Um, and I think what, what management have to do is, is recognize they have got a series of obligations. It isn't as simple as saying, you know, shareholder value. And I think as Jack Welsh has famously said, you know, simple, simply pursuing shareholder value is the most stupid idea I've ever heard. Because if that's how you think you create it, you've, you've really got another thing coming. You have to create a sustainable business. That will create value. That's absolutely fine. But unless you're willing to make the case and stand up for those things, then you know you, you will always be in the slipstream of other people who will get there first. Okay. It's not that different from, I mean, just the general innovation process. Yeah. I mean, P&G's, you know, innovation's in the lifeblood, and so there's an innovation pipeline going off, you know, way out five years in the future. So, it, I mean, if you're only worried about next quarter's yeah. earnings, why would you do innovation for yeah. what's going to come in five years? So, in a way, it's about predicting what's, what the future's going to look like, what are consumers going to want, what's the commodity situation going to mm. be, what's the energy situation. So, it's actually, it's the enlightened self-interest. It's not yeah. the short-term, it's the long-term yeah. enlightened self-interest. I mean, the way we look at this, we've done, it, I mean, with consumers, we've had a very clear strategy of no trade-offs mm. in the... We don't say ask consumers to trade off a product, um, the performance or the, the, the value, because it's sustainable. We want for you know you do products that are they work, yeah, yeah. they give good value, and they're more sustainable. And we take the same and we've taken the same approach within the business. It's got to make sense. Now, it may not make very short-term sense, yeah. <laughs> but it's got to make long-term business sense. And you've got to have a, a clear way of actually making it, commercialising it. And it's the same with all, you know, if you introduce new materials, the first time you do it, it's going to cost more because then it's not around. It's only once you get into, you know, the volume, uh, you actually get the cost down and then you can actually uh, turn it profit. So in a way, I mean, looking at the future for carbon, you know, mm -hmm. the future of carbon, it's the future of your business. It's the future of the consumer's energy mm -hmm. supply uh, and, and, and so on. Um, I mean, your point, you, you mentioned... It's great if consumers, you tell consumers they don't have to pay for their electricity. Mm -hmm. we, we had an advertising campaign in the US, basically said you get your detergent for free. Because if you watch at low temperature, you save so much on your energy. <laughs> it's the, it, yeah. Over the course of the year, it's the equivalent of being given the detergent for free. And again, that beats That's suddenly that people exactly. go, ah, mm. then it makes sense. Yes. For me, um, you know, I go back to really simple levels. You know, the customers that shop in Sainsbury's tell us what they want simply no doubt the same thing in, in, in Ian's um, business too um, but but fundamentally the scarcity of, of supply of food product 
linked to climate change, you know, absolutely has generated us to think differently about how we are going to move forward in the things that we do within Sainsbury's. Um, but picking up on Ian's point earlier, absolutely, the, um, the commodity and energy future prices are absolutely key for us. Yeah. And I'll just give you a real simple example within Sainsbury's. Um, within Sainsbury's alone, if we just think about our portfolio of our stores, um, my energy bill is around about £170 million pounds a year. By 2020, if we just take the debt curve that, that we, we all used to see in, that bill is, go is going to triple. And that's one hell of a, of, of, of a sustainable value that we have to make sure we do the right thing to mitigate, as well as worrying about the things that we need to do to do the right thing for the climate change and the impact on crops and growing. Um, it's a vitally important thing for us. Magnus, you, I know you've been involved in thinking about how to operationalise this. Now, one of the themes that's come out here is you, you've got to make a business case, uh, it, whether it's about hedging against future commodity prices or energy prices or better sales. How do you, you know, you're doing you're in a business to business area. How do you measure the impact? This not only on your sales, but measure it in a way that you can demonstrate <laughs> that it has a benefit both in the short, short and the long term. I think that is a, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, we, we measure the impact that we help to avoid. So uh, let me give a couple of examples. We from SKF, we can provide solutions which in their own right provide uh, environmental benefits, such as b uh, low friction bearings, so we have bearings with 30% less friction compared to baseline bearings, standard bearings. So in their own right, they use less energy. And that we can measure, we, and we can quantify that. We also have solutions which help to enable certain applications at the customer. Take an example, rotor positioning bearings that make it possible to use stop-start systems in cars which in turn uh, can improve the fuel economy of the car. So here we can measure the effect uh, of the car, which we then help to enable. We have also solutions which help to enable, let's call them environmentally sound industries, like the full electric car that we are so an example of. We provide technologies for that. We also provide technologies for the whole renewable sector, and we drive innovation very much in that direction. And there we can also see, we can measure the effect uh, at the customer application level, and we can, we can say uh, what is our contribution to that. And uh, I think, globally speaking, we are in the need of more uniform ways to define what is climate positive, new uniform ways in terms of methodologies to measure it, and there are some very important points uh, within that. Take for example the baseline solution. So we can provide solutions that perform better compared to a baseline solution. A baseline solution can be a previous solution from your own company. Mm -hmm. It can be a solution from a competitor. It can be the industry average. Mm -hmm. It can be the second best technology. In SKF, we use the most common solution on the market as the baseline. We, you also need to have a criteria to define what is a significant enough of improvement. And uh, so with that as a backdrop, we have developed an SKF methodology on this, which we uh, want to share uh, with transparency, so that we can not only report on the actual result, but also on the way we got to the result. Yeah, that's interesting. But so remember, Paul, referring back to your friend, Mr. Nemesis, your CFO, uh, the sort of things that Magnus has been talking about, would, does that work, for, would that work for him? Um, it, it does work for him. Mm -hmm. um, I think, for me, having data is critical. Yeah, so, um, 
if you can show, prove, demonstrate, measure, keeping it simple, um, the benefits are, are second to none. So for me, it's around, you know, the, the old adage, you, you can't fix what you can't measure is absolutely true. And when you've got a, a significant number of, of activities across the whole of Sainsbury's happening in at once, and the plates are spinning um, in different reasons and at different paces, having that corrective data coming back and feeding back to understand exactly what your investments are, are, are doing is, is vitally important. But that's probably, it, it's quite simple. It's simple for Sainsbury's. It sounds complex, but it is quite simple. The most frustrating thing that I perceive happening is not so much the, the, the ability to get the data in, it's the level playing field or the ability to have a consistent criteria to report against regardless of what business we're in. So government has an important part to play in this, as well as us, um, as well as those businesses that are, 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 are should be doing the right thing to get to that consistency. So we are measuring against the same thing. If we just talk about the UK alone, then the amount of, of, of burden that we have to apply just to get in various forms of, of information gathered through greenhouse gas reporting for CRC, through to um, carbon disclosure projects, um, through to energy performance certificates. They are so vast and we need to have that common platform so we all know how well we're doing against each other and then we can then start to collaborate better because we know what we need to support each other on. Just to uh, build on Paul's <coughs> point, uh, I think a lot of our um, last five years has been focused on greenhouse gas, and obviously we're talking about climate. I think there is a bigger challenge emerging, which is a sort of complete impact assessment, and it's particularly introducing natural capital and understanding some of the other impacts. And you know, we've also got a 1,000 stores. I'm really interested in trying to measure my net community impact. Mm. Now, that's a very different challenge from being able to add up my electricity bill every year and work out you know, what I've done with it. So I think we're moving into the next phase of accounting for sustainability where you need to think about a quite holistic view of your total impact, both on natural and human uh, capital. And I think trying to work out how we do that at a company scale, there's some really interesting stuff going on with Natural Capital Committee and other things doing nat national accounting, which is great. The big push for me would be, can we get to uh, a company base, which isn't as difficult, uh, much as I admire people like Puma uh, and others who've done their full p and um, you know, for us to do that for 40,000 products in 1,000 stores would be really difficult. So we need a next generation, 21st century, double entry bookkeeping accounting level of metrics. And I think that's going to be a really important unlock and one where, again, we need to collaborate to make sure it's, it's used and effective. I'm just going to throw in there that I, mean, I think it was Tom who said earlier the, the, the tyranny of numbers. I mean, <laughs> it's the 80. I would say that I would agree with you to get the 80 for the 20, mm. right? Because otherwise you yep. get hung up on the numbers. And I mean, Completely. at the end of the day, I mean, we're talking really about scope three for everything. Um, and mm. and I mean, scope three for carbon's hard enough to do and work out what's included. If you do scope yeah. three for everything, and the other thing, there's a, there is a danger there of double counting in that your scope three is someone else's scope, scope one, one or scope two. And so you, you know, everybody starts adding them all up and you get to a very yeah. funny total. So uh, It does seem to me though that, you know, that on this theme that while you do need to be able to count and as you say, you need to be able to measure it to be able to change it, we shouldn't get too hung up on it because we, I mean, I read an interesting article in, in Daedalus, which is the Proceedings of the American Society of Science and Arts, which took issue with the fact that we need 95% confidence before we yeah. make any sort of decision. Yeah. Well, for most of our daily lives, about 50% is more than enough. <laughs> so if it happens to be someone's scope through and someone else's scope one, that shouldn't be a blockage for doing anything about it. And I think that, that comes to me, we can go back to some of the th issues that were brought up at the beginning. Where do you start on this? I mean, you've, mm -hmm. you've got to make your business case. What, you, you talked about, Ian, you talked about some exemplar projects. Is that, yeah. is that the way to get it going? Um, well, first of all, I echo Peter's point, the, uh, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good here, and, and if you get hung up on trying to analyse this to the nth degree, you'll never get anywhere. So there is a need, I think, now to get to action. I, th I think you still have to start with what's your framework, so where have you chosen to have an impact, and I think that is still the thing which does repay a lot of effort, because you've got to think, so we use timber because a third of all our products contain some form of timber. 
uh, and, and you know, keep on saying these sorts of things, you know, forest the size of Switzerland every year as goes into our group. So that is obviously a place for us to start. Then for us, when we've got our four pillars of where we're going to play, then it turns into, well, what could we do that would demonstrate this on the ground? And I would just add one point which we haven't touched on yet, which is uh, for a, a, a multinational group like us, only 40% of our business is in the UK. Um, the, the, the operating challenge and the sustainability challenge actually is quite diff different. Uh, if you're in Russia, if you're in China, you're in Turkey, you're in Poland, you're in France, you're in Spain, actually the conversations are very, very different. So what we've tried to do is say, here are the themes. Now, how does that play out? And can we start to have active work on the ground together with some group-wide themes which are sort of non-negotiable? So responsible timber sourcing is a group dimension, but it's a lot harder to get there in, say, uh, China or actually even Russia, which is stuff full of forestry. They haven't got a, a Russian word for sustainability, so it's, it's early days yet there. But we know we have to do that. But when we come to timber, what we, how we get the first projects is, is very different. So in the UK, we're launching a working woodland scheme, which is trying to get local wood fuel uh, connected to, to uh, our supply chain, which we think you know, we're going to do 11,000 hectare project. That could be uh, you know, millions of hectares if we can scale it. In Spain, it's all about trying to protect and regenerate forests around forest fires, because that's the big issue in, in timber in Spain. And what plays out in, for example, Russia may be more to do with helping communities um, you know, sort out their water supply, because there's a big issue with leaded water pipes. Uh, what we're saying to the individual operating units is, look, we recognize this is different, and we're not as globalized as, say, P&G. Um, where can we have the biggest impact, and can we find things that scale? But for me, the interesting thing about working woodland is that sounds theoretically great, and I can see why it would work, but how can someone show me the practicalities? How do I get into these woods? How do I find the exact right level of payment that will make it work? What type of machinery do I really need to get out of them? And it's the difference between floating at 50,000 feet and actually operating on the ground. And that, for me, is, is the next big challenge, is saying, I can talk about the circular economy power tool. You know, I've talked about this stuff six minutes of use a year. How do we design differently? We're just going to the point where we've got a grant to go out and redesign it. So I'm actually getting my hands on real power tools now. And for me, that's much more exciting as, as a retailer than debating the concepts because, I, yeah, fine, I've done that. Now show me how this works. And I think that, for me, working first and then scaling as opposed to just hope, hoping all this will happen is, is really the critical next step. Is that true for you guys as well? Yeah, just, just to build on that, I think for me, you know, you know with, with a, a vast array of, of product lines and processes, sometimes you can't see the wood for the trees if you're not mm. careful. So I think for me, within Sainsbury's, we've taken the approach that says, of course, we want to have vision for all those trees, absolutely. But let's go to the show and tell. Let's really explore some of those opportunities to go in deep and prove that what we're trying to achieve is, is achievable. Um, and there are various scales. So there's one of them is, you know, Sainsbury's has said all the fish that it sources will be through MSC, Marine, Marine Stewardship Council. Well, that's one scale. But well, the next scale is actually to say, well, let's take our dairy development group. So we have thousands of farmers that work for us producing milk. And actually, simplistically, um, you know, a cow, creates a lot of <laughs> environmental impact. Yeah. So we've been working with the supply chain um, very, very closely um, in a really collegiate manner to work out what it is we can do to that supply chain to help them reduce the amount of water that you use in the milk processing perspective, but also simply how can we help the cows to eat better, to, to burp less, <laughs> Um, because it's the burping end that creates the methane more than the other end. Um, <laughs> how can we help them to do that? And we've been very successful. <coughs> and and you know, the collaboration and sharing that information with other dairy groups in other retailers has been very effective. I was going to say, I mean, if you build on what uh, Ian was saying, it, it's sort of like three, three steps. The first is relevance. Mm. You yeah. know, and finding what is the relevant, you know, relevance to your business because... I mean, it's a big issue in, in, in climate terms, deforestation. Mm. Okay, so what's deforestation got? The, where, where does P&G and deforestation intersect? Yeah. And you sort of get down to, well, actually, you know, if you look in our supply chains, you know, it's palm oil, oil yeah. um, and it's mm. pulp and paper. Mm. 
So <coughs> you, you've identified that. Then the second thing, once you've, worked, once you've got to relevance, is hotspots. Mm. Um, finding out where, the, where are the significant impacts, as opposed to trying to add everything up. You, know, where, you, you can do a fairly straightforward you know, screening LCAs and things like that, and it will tell you, here are your big hotspots. Um, and then thirdly, action in that, you know, having the number is one thing, but, so, okay, so what are we going to do about this? You know, so you go, you, you, you go, you sort of triage down to what you could actually do about this. And then, you know, we got to the point of, okay, well, you know, on palm oil, we need to make sure it's, you know, um, certified. Palm oil is relatively straightforward. The um, <laughs> palm kernel oil gets more difficult and derivatives get really difficult. So you start working down how you do that. Um, pulp and paper, you know, um, is it, is it certified sustainable? And so, you know, we've just come out with, you know, gone one step further and said, okay, all um, paper products will be certified sustainable by 2015. The packaging bit, packaging is much mm. more complicated in, yeah. in terms of its, um, the supply chain than, than paper products. That's going to take longer because it's really complex. And so there we said 2020, but it's, you're going down that path. But it's that relevance, hotspots, action and, and, and then you actually get to something at the end as opposed to numbers. Okay. Okay. I think uh, also w we shall say that w we want to drive change in a certain direction so I, I also don't think we shall get caught up in the numbers so uh, in terms of SKF we say we shall do activities so that we can reduce our impact towards zero, the, the impact from our operations, we shall do activities that can help others to reduce their impacts, typically our customers. Still within that, oh, I should also say SKF is an engineering company. We have uh, a lot of engineers within the company. We, we sell to uh, a lot of engineering companies. We use the term for this, do not <laughs> over-engineer it. Let's not over-engineer this whole thing. And we, we constantly come back to finding a good balance between, on the one hand, making something which is credible, but also something which is practical, because we need to implement this. Within our organization, we need to communicate it to others. So it has to be credible as well as practical. Within this, uh, though, I think there is also the need to somehow demonstrate the impacts, so we need to have some good cases, and when doing that, we need to quantify. So we make quantifi quantifications on the environmental performance of specific solutions, and in that, there is a need for more common methods and so on. But I think that is a small part of a much broader issue, and the broader issue is rather to drive change in a certain direction. Great, thank you. We've got a few minutes. so. Are there any questions from the floor? There's a lady at the front here. The mic will be coming. If others could put their hands up, we'll take two or three questions at once. Lady in the front, gentleman in the pink shirt here. Any other questions? I've got two. Okay. I'm Elizabeth Block, a writer on renewables. This is probably pretty predictable, Mr. Crew, but you say you know you're working with your dairy farmers. You say you have 20, but you have 23 million customers. Was that a day, a year? Anyway, they're still getting plastic bags, and it does seem to me that the supermarket chains here should have got together a long time ago and said we will have no more plastic bags, and got in some eco materials, it, charging people tuppence or ten pence if they forget to bring a bag is, not, is clearly not enough. And I'm wondering what your plans are for the future in terms of packaging. The plastic bags are kind of packaging. I'm very sorry to still have to go into a supermarket and have to decline a plastic bag every time, often for one item. Just take the question here and then, oh, yeah, gentlemen in pink here. Yes, uh, lovely debate, thank you. Um, Robin Wood, Renaissance too. Um, uh, Ian said something about the circular economy and, and one of the, the issues that's going through my mind, I'd, I'd really like to get everybody's point of view, is how you, how you shift the habits of a lifetime of owning stuff um, and how you also shift the habits of a lifetime of terrible service in most countries for most things. 
to get anybody to come and do anything for you for less than 100 of your currency, whatever currency you're in. So that I'd really like to understand, what, how are you testing out how to get that yeah. in, into action? Because um, the motivational issues are, are, are very, and it's, com it's very complex too, so, but thank you. Thanks, Paul, do you want to just um, take that first question? Yes. And then I think, ask you all to think about this, you know, the, sec the second question we've had, but also thinking about across geographies. How do you deal with that, different cultures in different places? Okay. Just on the customer front, we have 23 million customers a week which, which, which shop with us. Um, not 23 million exactly, because it, that some visit us once or twice, so the 23 million transactions per week. Um, on the, 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 the carry bag front, we work very closely with government, we work close, very closely with RAP, um, the Waste and Resources Action Planning, about what it is the whole of retail needs to do to to provide the right service for customers, because ultimately customers tell us what they absolutely want. Yeah, um, and we we listen to those customers. Again, that's vitally important that as 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 trusted retailers we do that 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 point. Um, and you know, in various um, uh, areas across the UK, um, the government has made the decision to to enforce um, levies on carrier bags. Um, and we do support those levies as and when they come through. But ultimately, our customers drive what they are asking for us to provide. But we consistently look at alternative solutions to provide um, the need in various forms. And we do look to explore different mediums, different materials. And we currently do day in and day out to, to, to do that. Mark, um, <coughs> maybe respond with, with one other hat on, which is the chairman of the British Retail Consortium, since i um, sort of speaking on behalf of all retailers for a second. Um, the two areas of focus have been uh, long life bags, which pretty well every retailer has gone to, and pretty well every retailer is doing some version of an incentive scheme. We, we stopped, we, we did this at B&Q now over five years ago. Um, the problem is not there, it's in the single use bags, where there is still clearly a consumer demand for some form of receptacle and, and frankly at the moment the materials technology and the supply is not there to do a sort of fully you know for example the, there's a lot of chat about degradable bags uh, th there's some real dodgy claims made on on how degradable these bags are I think the ultimate answer is 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 a fully recycled sources bag because then you are using starting to use all the by waste byproducts of other industries to create your own circular loop at the moment, there isn't just quite a capacity or technical solution. I, I think, frankly, in five years, we probably will have it. And governments, as Paul was saying, will continue to legislate. So it's clear that in the UK, in, in England, rather, we will see a similar scheme to probably Wales and Scotland shortly. And, and sorry, just, just to add to that, um, in, and I, and I, you know, I'll talk about Sainsbury's. I'm pretty sure it's in, in the rest of the retailers too. We do take this seriously, and in every single store, um, whether that's a small yeah. convenience store or a large store, there is a recycling facility for carrier bags. Mm. And those carrier bags absolutely are closed loop. So when they're returned, yeah. the giveaway bags, they are absolutely recycled back into product. So, and I, I think we are seeing materially lower levels than before. We're just, again, not, not there yet. And we'll keep, we'll keep trying. Um, going to the um, circular economy model and some of the challenges there, um, maybe three quick points. Firstly, all the work on circular economy says you have to design it in from the beginning in the product and uh, product service mix. So this isn't something that you just slap onto an existing product, new flash saying circular, um, because that would just, you know, you can put a lot of lipstick on a bulldog, it's still a bulldog. So you're actually gonna have to really redesign it. Um, secondly, as the redesign, you have to think about the total system costs. So, um, there are going to be labor costs that are going to feature more, more heavily in this. Um, but I think providing you take the lifetime analysis and the total flows in the system, you can actually look at it with a very different lens. So in addition to getting your detergent for free, if you can actually do an end-to-end -end takeaway and sell the consumer a cost per wash, and you deal with the totality of it, actually, you know, the McKinsey study suggests that actually the higher MPV, both for consumer and for producer, but you have to reconfigure the entire system. And I think it's fair to say um, that it's going to be easier in certain economies than others. Um, and it is going to force us to think heavily about 
how much s service you add, because in a high wage economy, adding a pile of service makes the economics very difficult. In, in Poland, it's a lot easier. In China, it's a lot easier. So I think we're going to see hybrid models emerge in different wage cost eco economies. Um, but the, the final bit, I think, will be to work out how much the consumer is going to come with you. And I think you've got early examples, you know, for the first time ever, West German, uh, in the West German, the German consumer, male ownership of cars, if you're under 30 male, is now falling for the first time. If you talk to under 30-year-olds in, in London, they don't really own cars, it's, it's pretty unusual. Now, in those places, a shared model, a zip car, a streetwise type model, makes enormous sense. If you've had that experience in one place, might you then say, well, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll rent this out. And seeing things like shared hotel B, uh, B2B and things like that, people are beginning through social media, I think, to think very differently. So my final bet on this is it's pinned on the sub-30 cohort who are social, digital, social media digital natives. They're exploring different ideas about do you have to own it. And you know, they're now comfortable owning things either digitally or remotely in a way that the previous generation would never have dreamt of doing. So I think with a lot of effort, there's a lot of change and opportunity and disruption coming. I think, I think I mean, the, the time is right in that you need, you need the internet and you need you know, yeah. digital to, get to, to make use of that um, spare capacity. Exactly. Um, in the past, you, you know, you you, if it wasn't in your garage, no. you didn't have access to it. So it's... it's yeah. but, uh, <coughs> right, I'm going to take... Can I take through these three questions very, very briefly because we don't want to keep people from their lunches. So you can just say who you are and a very quick question, and then I'll have final remarks from the four panelists. Thank you. Uh, Tim Howard Glasson from Energy Bank. Thanks for all four of your presentations, clearly uh, leading um, on these sustainability issues. I wanted to just ask you about a comparison between your organizations, which are all, as I understand it, shareholder organizations, with another uh, leader in this field, IKEA which, to my understanding, is owned entirely by a foundation and therefore able to take a very long-term perspective, arguably to value the future as much as today and take a zero discount rate. And presumably the challenges that you have in your companies, uh, Paul talked about it, having the conversation with the finance director, do you think that there's ever a point where <coughs> shareholder companies are going to be able to take certain issues and value the, where they can value the future just as much as they value today? Thank you. A couple of people at the back here, the lady in the blue top, and the gentleman behind. Hi, Cheryl Bone from Imperial College. Thanks very much for your presentations today. Um, I know that um, Ian touched on this with net community impact, um, and I'm really interested to learn more about this because I feel I don't hear enough about mm -hmm. how equality and social measurements play yeah. the role play an important role in your sustainability strategies. So if you could elaborate a little bit on that, that'd be great. Thank you. And finally, just behind you. Morning. Uh, Eva Muller from UNEPFI. Um, we work with, uh, with finance institutions across the globe. Um, what is your perspective in, in terms of the financial sector driving change? I mean, uh, <laughs> comparatively, you're much closer to to the producers um, and, and also consumers and then finance institutions. Do you feel there's been a growing push from investors towards uh, a more sustainable way of production? And how, how is that manifesting itself? Through engagement, through voting, uh, through investment policies? Or, are you, or haven't you seen so far any changes from the investment community? Great, thanks for those questions. So one about, is there a difference between organizations, you know, PLCs with shareholders and those that are either private or in one case owned by a foundation? And is there a way that shareholder owned corporations can value the future in the same way as the present? Around how do we measure and gauge the social impact and community benefits? And then what are, is the financial community? Is the, are investors driving this kind of change? So Two of those three questions, if you can use that as a way of wrapping up mm -hmm. uh, your final remarks. And I'll start at the far end with Magnus and come this way. Okay. So uh, let's start with a question about uh, shareholder versus fa family owned. In, uh, I cannot say that, uh, that we, we view that as something very different. I mean, from, from the SKF perspective, which uh, that is a shareholder uh, owned company, but 
we drive these things because we think it makes business sense. Sometimes you see the short-term return, sometimes it's more a long-term return, but all, all in all it makes business sense to, to do it. So um, that's not really an answer to your question, but I cannot really uh, <coughs> provide um, more input to it. Uh, on this question about the community impact, well in SKF we define uh, sustainability in terms of SKF care. And SKF care has four cornerstones. One is business care, which says we shall of course make a good long-term uh, profits, but we shall do them with the highest possible ethical standards. We have the environmental care, which we have talked about pretty much now. We have the employee care, which says we shall provide safe uh, uh, work workplaces, uh, uh, opportunities for personal development and growth of the employees and so. And finally, the fourth cornerstone of our way to define sustainability is community care, where we encourage all local uh, units to uh, bring positive contributions to their local communities. We don't drive this as a group uh, strategy, but we uh, we let individual uh, units decide how to best support their local communities. So, um, finally, on this uh, financial sector, I think uh, there is one example of where I see that there has been a, a large contribution from that, and that is uh, all the questions that we, we get from um, different sustainability index uh, uh, ratings which I think put, put uh, a lot of uh, food for thought. It, it makes things uh, more comparable, and I think that, uh, that also drives some um, increasing activities. We also see more and more questions from investors about the actual sustainability performance. So, uh, I, yes, I think that, that is uh, uh, one part in this uh, global change uh, effort. I think the question about um, privately versus uh, publicly held is, is, is an interesting one. I mean, at the end of the day, it's up to us to demonstrate shareholder value out of this activity. And I think all the comments we've had, you know, long term, this is enlightened self-interest and it's long term shareholder value. Um, and it's a way of actually monetizing that. Sometimes the discount rate can work against you, but you've got to demonstrate that. The financial sector, I'm afraid, I mean, we talk to them all the time, but the, the ones who are most interested in this are the SRI funds, and they are the, the, still the very small end of the, the market. But if you can talk about this, I mean, when we're talking this in terms of innovation and future services or products, and also um, we're talking about this, this is about security of supply, where your energy is going to come, where your materials, that shows you've got a robust strategy into the future, then the mainstream um, financial um, actors are much more interested in that. So uh, again, it's about how you talk about this. If you talk about it as an add-on, as if it was a CSR policy, well then you're talking to a very small audience. But if you're talking about this, this is strategic to the long-term business, then the whole industry takes note. The, the question about social impact, absolutely important. Um, I told you what, p and statement of purposes, p and Improves the, provides products that improve the lives of the world's consumers. There is a second bit that we never talk about, we, we don't talk because it goes on a bit, but it says, as a result, um, our shareholders um, and the, our, our employees and the communities in which we live will prosper. And so there's a recognition at the heart that what we do as a business is going to have a social impact. Uh, and I think that comes back to this whole idea of net positive. I think the real question is what's in your net all right how big is your net because you know you can have a very great social benefit and then try and minimize your environmental so your net overall is positive that you could have net environmental okay so you you your benefits on water versus benefits on climate and deep and uh, ecosystems and the rest or you can have climate net which is the smallest one of all and i think you know, mo uh, most businesses would claim that to be net positive overall, or we would certainly. When you get down to net environmental, then it, it gets more difficult. Net climate in particular, then you're talking about very specifics um, and that how you're trading off and offsetting and all the rest. So uh, to me, the whole question about net positive is what's in the net? From, from my perspective, um, from a shareholder value perspective, um, 
Absolutely. I, I believe um, that at a point in time, you know, what we're doing in this environment will be a differentiator um, for the um, investors. Um, right here and now, you know, we, we are trying to ensure that we talk about climate change and the impact of what we do uh, at every opportunity when we meet investors. Um, and so much so that as we've produced our annual reports and our interim reports, you know, the CFO and my CEO, Justin, have a very balanced approach about talking about all the great numbers we've achieved, hopefully, and also around about the great stuff that we're actually doing in this, in this space because it's the right thing to do for our customers. With regards to the, um, the social impact, absolutely, I talked about our 20 by 20 sustainability plan, and there are 20 clear objectives for us to achieve um, by 2020. Four of those 20 are absolutely around the social impact that Sainsbury's can have on areas in which we, um, we trade. And with regards to the, final, uh, the financial sector question, um, all I can go is, is from the amount of calls and the amount of um, communication that I get over the past three or four months from the financial investment um, arena asking me to, to cut through and be involved with um, new investments in new technologies and in new business growth. And that's the judgment I get, so I think they're hotting up. Okay, um, <clears throat> finishing off that, I, I would say IKEA is still ferociously competitive commercial organisation. So, do, and, uh, and I'm, sh you know, I know the same is true for Waitrose and John Lewis. So, your your ownership model doesn't mean you're not sort of commercial and a pretty hard nose. The one difference I think it does make is you have longer time horizons, and we compete with two. Uh, the main international competitor for us, Laura and Milan, around the world is privately owned. They take a 25-year-plus view on property in a way that I can't capitalise things the same way. I recognise that's part of doing business. I think it's got pluses and minuses. I still think in business terms I'm as long-term thinking as they are, and if I explain that adequately to my shareholders, they, they should be okay. So I don't see that as a, as a crippling um, disadvantage and, and unless the metrics start to shift. I think in terms of um, social impact, um, I'd probably distinguish two things there. We, we've chosen our particular area, again, to have a social impact. And again, it's enlightened self-interest. We've found that if we have higher engagement scores in our local community, our sales in that store are better. So this is not stupidity. This is sort of long-term self-interest. But we've gone for two aspects, one of which is, as we heard with Street Club, can we can help people connect, particularly in Western Europe, neighborhoods are getting disconnected, they're getting fragmented, and can we help them share skills and transfer skills, obviously, particularly, again, self-interest around improving your home. But if we do, we can have an impact there with things like DIY classes and street club, which other people can't, so that's our contribution. The broader issue about, I think, ethical capitalism and things like equality and income, I think are gonna become much bigger issues, and I think, again, businesses are gonna have to choose where, where they play. But finally, on investors, um, very short answer, no. I don't think uh, anything is happening. Um, the SRI people are very active, but they don't make the decisions in the portfolios. So I would say, uh, characterize it as, when investors ask me questions, I don't hear about um, net positive, even though it's one of our eight strategic pillars. When I talk to investors, they hear about it. But it's me on transmit, I'm not being asked. Great, thank you very much. Well, a, a lot of themes have come out of this and I won't, won't go for an exhaustive summary, but it's clear from everyone talking about a journey. So it's about learning by doing. It's about picking things that are relevant for the external world and also relevant for your own business. We clearly need some work, collaborative work about thinking about how to define it, about how to measure it. And, but collaboration, because I think net positivity, from what I've heard, requires a systems approach that probably goes beyond the company, not only in its supply chain and its customers, but other uh, companies as well. And, and a number of other themes that I'm hoping that we picked up in the rest of the conference, and particularly in the working groups this afternoon. So just to finish, a big round of applause for our, our speakers now. Thank you. <laughs>